It's not the best lighting right now. It's a little harsh and my audio may be a little rough because of the wind. If so, please excuse that. But I wanted to take a moment to make a quick video or relatively quick, at least in the terms of editing on my side, about this article. An article that you may have seen if, like me, you spend a lot of time online reading about gardening, watching YouTube videos, TikToks, Instagram reels about gardening, like my whole sort of uh, algorithm is is gardening which i love and i've seen this article but more so than seeing this article i've seen a lot of reactions to this article that have bothered me and those reactions tend to fall in two different camps the first one being fear-mongering uh, saying that look at this research this is how they're going to start to regulate us that they're going to say that we can't have our own gardens because of co2 and climate change and that they don't want us to be self-sufficient this is how it starts uh, i think that's absolutely wackadoodle uh, and it is just completely unbased and they're one just looking at the actual you know article that for me came on yahoo N news and not actually talking about the research. The second camp of people talk kind of about the research and saying about how it's wrong, but don't actually address the research. And I saw a video uh, like that yesterday and I commented on it. So the garden nerd, and I'm, I can leave a link down to their, their video uh, and I'll also link to their original research. Um, but if you agree with me and think that their take is wrong, like don't say disparaging things on their channel. Like be, be kind, don't be a dick. Um, but on their video, I said, you did a massive disservice for not talking about the research study and most of the points you raised were either incorrectly framed or actually addressed in the original research. And they responded back, I look forward to your video where you address all the topics in the way you feel would do its service. Go ahead and post it here. I can't wait to watch it. So uh, the garden nerd, thank you for replying to my comment. This is that video where I am going to talk about the research. Before I talk about the research, to provide some background about me, uh, Tyler Lloyd, uh, this is my YouTube channel, uh, avid home gardener, grew up gardening, but in addition to that, I have a degree in biology focusing in ecology, I have a master's degree in environmental science, and a master's degree in public affairs uh, focusing on uh, environmental policy, uh, where I did a whole lot of life cycle analysis, which is what this study is. I've been a research scientist, and my job for the past eight years has been turning uh, research and science into policy. So that is my background, but just because I have these titles doesn't mean that you should believe me at all. Uh, <laughs> listen to what I have to say, but definitely go read the original research paper. So let me uh, pull up my notes on that real quick. I've got some screenshots of various sections of the paper. So let's just start off by the, the, the title of the paper, Comparing the Carbon Footprints of Urban and Conventional Agriculture. That's all it is. You know, when they set out to do this study, I have to assume that they were interested in looking at urban agriculture, which has been growing and is great that it's growing, but looking at it from the lens of the carbon footprint. And that's all the study was on, was the carbon footprint. The study did not look at the ecological benefits, the societal benefits, all the other things that might be better with smaller scale urban agriculture uh, than you know conventional agriculture. They weren't looking at that. So this study was only focused on carbon footprint. So that's important to keep in mind and not to bring in other arguments that conflate what the research is saying. Additionally, you've got to look at, okay, what are we talking about when we're looking at urban agriculture versus conventional agriculture? Now, their study I thought was really interesting because they start off by saying a lot of studies on urban agriculture have focused on high-tech urban agriculture. Think vertical farming uh, where there's a lot of like hydroponic systems, takes a lot of infrastructure and energy and resources uh, to do it. And they said, well, maybe that's not the, the best thing to, to compare. They looked at low-tech 
urban agriculture. So things like my backyard garden here, a community garden, rooftop gardens, things of that nature in various different countries that they were looking at. And when also when we talk about conventional agriculture, there is maybe a default to, you know, monocrops, uh, which probably made up a lot of this, and I, I'll talk about that in a second. But monocrops of corn and soybean and wheat, which um, how they're done uh, largely dependent on fossil fuels and pesticides and other things, are not great uh, for the environment and ecology. But they do have some things in their favor, let's be honest, when we're talking about carbon footprint. So they set out to do this study to, to look and say, okay, urban agriculture is growing, it's an important part of food security, uh, people are into it, but you know, like, what's the carbon footprint in comparison to that conventional agriculture? Now they found that you know, the urban agriculture had a higher CO2 footprint, but my reaction when I saw that initially was, okay, maybe, maybe it does. What, what, what did they find and what were the drivers for that? Rather than saying, you know, oh, this can't be right. It's like, well, you know, it's a research paper. Let's see who did the research. Uh, University of Michigan, very well regarded uh, research university. And also it was in Nature, a very, very highly esteemed journal. So peer reviewed. Um, you look at the funding sources, it's not funded by, you know, big ag or anybody. You know, the National Institutes of Science and the various sort of forms of that in other countries were funding it, so the funding all looks above board. And, you know, I always default to, you know, scientists, for the most part, you know, even though you may disagree with this, don't have a motive. You know, they're just answering questions because they're inquisitive, uh, just like I am, maybe just like you are. And the article that everyone saw had a horrible title. The article that was actually done by Michigan University had a much better title that rather than focusing on the negative, tried to look to the benefit and what we could learn from the study. Say, okay, if the carbon footprint of urban agriculture is higher, why and how can we do better? So the first thing was to be to extend infrastructure lifetimes. Now, conventional agriculture is a, a business, and there are some urban agriculture that do lean towards being a business, um, but it's, it has a lot of other focuses as well. Conventional agriculture, a business, they want to invest in things that have a good payback, that are durable, and with that durability and those investments, it lowers their carbon footprint. Home growers, people who have gardens in their backyard, do a lot of things that are unsustainable. One would be raised beds, and I am sitting on a raised bed. I've got raised beds behind me. Uh, but raised beds aren't always the best thing because you have to think about well, what is that raised bed made out of? There is a carbon cost to the materials for making a raised bed. So if you can grow in the ground, which is what I'm going to be developing this year um, and expanding my garden, that is much better because you don't have those resources put in there. I see all of these ads for these metal raised beds, especially ones that are really tall that you then have to fill and bring off-site material in, which has a carbon cost to filling those raised beds. Well, that metal Metal, metal is very carbon intensive and so it's gonna just add to the the amount and if you're buying a lot of stuff that is cheap and flimsy and gets you know destroyed and you have to throw it away that is also adding to your carbon footprint one thing that comes to mind are cheap flimsy little greenhouses that's essentially like a plastic tent that the second that there is any little bit of wind that thing is going to disintegrate and that has a large carbon footprint that is adding to the overall carbon footprint so there are a lot of things that urban agriculture is doing that um, is you know, infrastructure that is not built uh, for the long term. So it, it you know, has an impact there. But one thing that you can do is to invest in things that are gonna last longer and have a smaller carbon footprint. I have a few raised beds that are off camera uh, that are made out of logs. Logs from trees that uh, had to come down um, because they were in, in the way, they weren't good quality trees, they were growing crooked towards the house or they came down in a storm. But those logs, you know, that I didn't have to bring those in. That wasn't from chopping down a tree and milling it like you know this raised bed right here. 
So bringing in things and repurposing things and buying stuff that is going to last and using it for many, many years will help lower the carbon footprint. The other thing that they talked about was use urban waste as inputs. And they talked about in that, in that section of the paper, they talked about one thing that was kind of bothersome as a waste, um, but they, it was a good point about water and how recycling water and rainwater capture that a lot of urban agriculture actually doesn't do it. And when I was working uh, and volunteering at the community uh, farm in DC, and the, a lot of the, all the irrigation was from municipal water. So all of that water that is coming, you know, when you turn on the faucet and if you're watering your garden that way, that water has a much higher carbon cost than the water that just, you know, comes out of the sky that falls on your roof that you could be collecting because that water had to be filtered uh, and purified and pumped and moved. So there's a lot of carbon cost there. Then that is what is raising the, the carbon cost of um, that, that urban agriculture. And then also talking about, you know, uh, composting and uh, recycling waste, but there is some downside to that sometimes because a lot of times people compost in such a way that isn't optimal, can generate a lot of methane and other greenhouse gases. So you gotta make sure that you're composting well. And then uh, one, one thing that I kinda wanna note about with the conventional agriculture is, you know, I am by no means a fan of conventional agriculture. I think that there should be more s small scale diversified farms. But one thing that conventional agriculture Hopefully that wind isn't too bad. One thing conventional agriculture has kind of going for it is the scale. There's an economies of scale there that allows them to lower their carbon footprint because they can mechanize and routinize things. Now, it's not great from uh, an ecological standpoint and diversity of having these monocrops, but it does add a whole lot of efficiency. And one thing that I th I've seen people bring up, uh, which the gardener did, was about the, the transportation costs, at least if you didn't do it, then your, your comments did. I've seen so many of these videos, so I may be mixing them up, I apologize. But about the cost of transportation and the, and the carbon footprint there, that you know the stuff in my backyard doesn't have to, to travel that far. Well, the paper, the paper looked at that. The paper didn't ignore that. Um, and from what I could tell in their methodology, I saw no, no flaws there and, and issues that they accounted for that. And one thing that they did that I thought was great to kind of make sure that they were comparing literally, you know, apples to apples and beans to beans, potatoes to potatoes, was they looked at certain crops. They weren't just looking at all of, you know, conventional agriculture versus all of urban agriculture. They were looking at certain crops to make sure that they were comparing them. And they found that, you know, some, some crops, like, you know, tomatoes grown in a greenhouse that are shipped across the country are gonna have a much higher carbon footprint. So in some things, that it actually makes more sense for urban agriculture to grow. Other things, it really doesn't. So they were actually comparing crops rather than just, you know, um, the two set of as monoliths, uh, which I think is very, very important to, to recognize there. And they didn't find that all urban agriculture was worse than all conventional agriculture. There were, I believe, 17, yeah, 17 out of the 73 sites that were studied for urban agriculture were out, that outperformed conventional agriculture, which is good to look at those as models to see, okay, what are they doing right? What are they doing right that then we can implement in our own you know, gardens, our community gardens, in our urban environments? So let's, rather than saying, this research has to be wrong, it's like, no, what, what are the findings? What was the, the source of that carbon? And what can we do to think a little differently? And then, let's see, is there any other points here? Yeah, upcycling, um, reusing things, um, I think I've made all my points. Oh, and then the last thing that, that they did say was to um, think about the, you know, the high levels of social benefit of urban agriculture. You know, there are lots of things that are good about urban agriculture that one can lower the carbon footprint, but that just weren't captured in this study. As I said in the beginning, you know, they were only looking at carbon footprint. 
Think about all of the community that urban agriculture creates. Um, the education and understanding of where your food comes from and how you relate to the ecosystem. The biodiversity, watershed management, reduction of pesticides and various other things. There's a lot of benefit that comes from urban agriculture. But it wasn't captured in this paper because that paper wasn't looking at it. You know, research has to be narrow <laughs> to be able to be to be done right. You can't add all these multivariant things. It just becomes way too hard. These researchers were looking at conventional agriculture from 270 sites, I think, maybe. Uh, I'll, I'll have the correct number if I was wrong there. Versus those 73 urban agriculture and looking at carbon footprint. I think this study was done correctly. You know, I read through all the facts and figures, looked through the methodology. There was nothing that stood out to me as being, you know, inherently wrong with it. I have problems with people's reactions to them uh, and not actually speaking to the study or just, you know, completely ignoring it and just fear mongering. Um, but hopefully this sheds some light and gives a different voice and a different take uh, to what I've been seeing online. So. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Tyler Lloyd. I make videos about living a happier, healthier, more sustainable life, and I wish you the very best. See you later. Bye.